All right, welcome everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Lainey Godfrey from DMF Lighting. I have known Lainey for many, many years. A little bit about Lainey, he's been in the custom electronics industry for 26 years and the custom installation industry for 20. Um, if you ask Lainey 10 business questions related to, you know, custom installation, probably be an expert in seven of them, maybe eight, I don't know. He you knows he know about a lot of things. For the last three years, Laney has been super passionate about lighting. He went and started working for DMF Lighting. And um, this is a really great webinar because we get to learn not only how to make our clients happy by giving them outdoor lighting, but we're helping to preserve the environment and uh, save some sea turtles. So, Bay, do you have anything with respect to the Zoom? Yeah, hi everyone, uh, this is Faye and this is my second event here with Gustavo. Really glad to be here. If you have any questions, please do raise your hand and uh, you can actually show a reaction as well in the lower right-hand corner. You can add reactions if you love something. And, um, um, but I know some of you guys, awesome, thank you, Deb. And if you prefer to ask questions via the chat, you can also do that. I know basically, I know nobody's brand new to Zoom. I just wanna mention there's a chat icon in the lower bar area. You click on that and you can ask your question in the chat. And I will um, both, uh, Gustavo and I will pay attention to the chat section. So we wanna make sure we cover all the questions. And if we are so lucky to get a flood of questions, We'll, be, uh, we'll make sure to follow up with Lainey and we'll make sure to address them after the meeting as well in case we don't get to all of them today. Um, last thing I would say, if you are not speaking, um, if you don't have a question uh, active, uh, make sure to turn off mute button um, or else I might have to mute you if there's a background noise or sound. Um, video on or off, it's completely up to you. We do always love to see your faces, but I understand that's uh, completely your personal preference. And if at any point during the meeting, you feel like you're not following, if there are instructions, um, please do you know, give us a shout out. We wanna make sure everybody follows along. Um, so that's it. All right, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Gus, for the intro. And yes, Gus and I have worked together on some pretty interesting things. Uh, Faye, pleasure meeting you today. You know, this is important to us as a company uh, we exist on the West Coast, but we do a lot of our service through the integration channel on the East Coast as well. Uh, I'm going to walk through a slideshow, and I'm going to share screen now and get that started. And we'll basically do some Q&A as we go, or if there's anything that jumps off the page that you got to know, don't hesitate to stop me. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, essentially, this is what DMF has done to contribute to uh, maintaining the species and helping the species of the sea turtles. And there's a lot more property that they exist in than just Florida, but for our purposes, we're gonna heavily focus on Florida today. As a general agenda, we need to know how lighting affects sea turtles, particularly the hatchlings, because if the hatchlings don't make it to water, there is no survival. They have enough built-in predators not called humans and not called uh, loud lights uh, that they have to overcome to begin with. Uh, what are the requirements for achieving a turtle friendly lighting scenario? And how does DMF achieve turtle friendly lighting? And how do you specify it with us? So we're gonna cover all those different points. Traditionally in beachfront lighting, sea turtles are phototactic. And so they're attracted to light. So as a hatchling coming out of the ground, if there's an overly bright source and it's not to the seaside, it's very easy for them to get confused. So traditionally the moon would be great, but the moon's not always at full frequency or there's cloud cover or there's situations where a noisy light environment takes over. If you've ever been to the middle of our country, you notice how the stars are brighter because the noise light level is so much lower in some of those areas. Florida itself, and you look at the map that we're providing here, uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and as well as the Coastal Construction Control and Line, controls where there's actual protocols for sea turtle lighting. 
and you're actually creating an environment that's in, in, in violation if you don't follow the protocols that are quote turtle safe throughout these blue counties and then all of the individual municipalities that have their individual restrictions. So as we were building our technology and adjusting the colors of our light output and our light engines, we made sure to be compliant with any standards that were available to us. Um, I'm not aware of any that are 100% dark, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that if things don't go in a positive direction, that that's what would be dictated. So notice our good friends in Miami seem to have more than enough concrete uh, to get around this. So I'm, I'm a little sad by that, but I totally understand there's not as many areas for them to actually lay hatchlings as there is when you go north and south of there. Uh, Gus has known me long enough that I call Miami the little foreign country in the middle of Florida. So when you talk about the golden rules of sea turtle lighting, it's very much important to look at the three key requirements. There's low shield long, which gives a very narrow light pattern and is not wide. It's not a very heavy footprint. The fixture needs to be mounted as low as possible for the lighting application. So even on a surface mount or on the back count of counter of a deck or an eave, you don't want to start getting these up high because the higher you go, the increased opportunity to distract the hatchling as they're moving through the environment. The second being lowest wattage lumens. There's restrictions to how bright we could actually build this. A lot of times within residential property, 750 all the way up to 1500 lumens in a light fixture is commonplace. What we're gonna actually do on the external of the house is 400 and below. And you'll notice the red, orange, amber tint. When I get to one of the future charts, you're gonna see a very specific color temperature that this applies to. So more often than not, as we've gotten into this side of the business, previous to the last few years, we sold a lot of unshielded bulbs. That was commonplace. The light source that we're gonna to need to be in these applications has to absolutely be shielded. It's almost like a filter built into the device itself. Pardon me for a moment. So when you see this chart here, we're very specifically talking about the nanometers that are specific to this color's output. This is extremely soft amber. I'm not going to use an orange word, uh, but it fits directly into a color, color spectrum that is specific to not creating distraction in how the sea turtles recognize light. If you put it close enough to shore, it could still be a defeating purpose. But this on the side of a home, behind the dunes, or this on the eve on the first level would be compatible with the ordinances that we showed previously. So how does DMF handle turtle power? And what did we do to get ourselves compliant? We stay with our modular profile. So any of the fixtures that we've built previous to now, you can use our standard down lights, our standard housings, our standard trims, all of these can be calibrated to what this turtle spectrum requires. What's important to realize is the more somebody like Gustavo knows what you're trying to achieve on the property, he can guide the right fixture and the right detail to accommodate that. We've been renowned for keeping a very simple approach to how we do our lighting. So we only offer a couple of actual modules and we have a wide array of trims and decorative stuff, but the core engine of what we're doing here fits in those same profiles. So it's important for someone like us to know what type of material you're setting this into, whether you're mounting it on the side, whether you're surface mounting from above. Those are what dictates how he designs the fixture, and then we provide the light engine that's going to be compatible. So we've launched our new DID series, which has given us a lot of market share and press throughout the industry. These are also been updated to be turtle compatible. We did our original series, 
but with improved driver technology and improved product flexibility, we can still give you a little range of operation that fits within the mold of what we're trying to achieve here today. Our cylinder configurator also uses the same type of light engine that match the turtle profile. I'm gonna show you a specific here in a minute of how you actually lay these out. Our normal one frame and our normal light engine, if you see here at the bottom, the turtle friendly spec stands all by its own. So in a residential application where we have choices, in these applications, we have to be very limited uh, to meet the compatibility that's required. This is called out in our design specs. So anytime we do a design spec for a job, we go through all of these product builders for different trims and color temperatures. But you'll notice in order for us to be able to do this outside in the environments that we're talking about, you have to go with the turtle friendly option. Something that's not necessarily called out from the state administration, but that all of us know working in coastal properties, you have to hold up against salt water. So DMF also does a marine grade finish that purely works on the exterior of the hardware we're using. So if we are doing surface mounts in an eave on a porch, we can treat the trims that anchor in conjunction with the light fixture. And those trims can then hold up to salt water for a number of years. If we neglect to do that, the likelihood to see wear in the trim in the first year is very high. Same thing to be said for the cylinder products. It's an actual application where we provide a heavy, almost gel coat induced type texture to the paint that really gives it a very rugged texture finish to hold up as long as possible. I'm not naive to say that the ocean would eventually win. We're just delaying the portion of time before it does win. The lights are sealed, so that's really not an issue for us. Uh, we don't use our adjustable lights terribly often in turtle application. Uh, we usually do the soft, general ambient flat surface lights. This is the build out for the cylinder. The cylinders have a lot of different options because we have a complete product family underneath those. But again, I, I wanna make mention, specking the turtle friendly and knowing that you wanna do it for a marine upgrade, that's gonna create a product that actually has a chance to exist externally and, and not struggle to do so. Okay, so we are back with Lainey Godfrey from DMF, and we are going through some questions about the turtle lighting that we didn't get to. Um, so Lainey, the first question I have for you is the light, the light cans that we are using for the turtle lights. What is the depth of them and how shallow can we actually, you know, how shallow are the cans actually available in the lighting housings? So yep. that, you know, what, what kind of different installations can they fit in? No, so in a low profile, we can work in a standard, what's commonly called a 3.0 or 4.0 hexagon box, uh, similar opening to a two gang frame, but the depth is less than two inches. So if you look at a DID2, even if we upgrade it for uh, turtle lighting in the turtle frequency and color spectrum, it's still not going to exceed that inch and three quarter depth that the box allows. And the concern with that particular device is you only have one trim that works at that depth. So the finished trim, even though we can still treat it for marine grade, uh, adds about a little quarter inch below the finished ceiling because it actually anchors on the module. Our conventional housings, even though those are four inches deep, then you have 20 some odd DMF trims to choose from, but you have to have that depth to use those upgraded trims. Okay. And then can you talk a little bit more about the marine grade finishes? What's the cost differential? How do we specify that? No. So we treat it very much like we do a custom paint finish, um, which normally on a retail side is a, a $450 to $500 setup, and then it's $20 per fixture. So the marine is very similar to that. Uh, if we do marine in conjunction with a standard finish, there's only one charge. If we do marine in conjunction with 
teal or, or some custom RAL color, then it's like two paint charges because you have the marine treatment and the RAL finish. So we have that ability in, in our production to go to that detail of paint. Um, yeah, I would tell people a lot of times in marine, a dark bronze or a black is ideally going to be in those landscape type devices. Uh, even those undercover eaves, white and black trim still ends up being commonplace. Uh, the black shows less wear. You know, eventually we all know the ocean will win, but the marine finish gives us some additional years life expectancy, pushing a five year plus type deliverable. Okay, so the warranty for the marine grade finish is five years? Yep. Okay. That's our standard warranty for standard application as well. So when we know that we're going to apply the marine uh, upgrade to it, we know it's going into a harsh condition. Uh, now keep in mind, we do expect a little bit of, quote, weathering. We don't expect it to look like a worn, rusted, degraded type device. So anything that sits outside, uh, there's nothing that can sit outside for five years and not show some element. Okay, thank you. And when we're talking, like, what are the options for, um, I know the best case scenario is you get the turtle lighting, you keep the turtle lighting year round. But for some people who say, well, you know, I want to explore changing out the drivers and changing out the lenses for X number of months a year. Have you, have you seen people do that? What does that process look like? Typically, we, we have folks that will do a secondary layer of light. But what the way DMF is engineered, if you and I have a standard DID2 in a ceiling, you know, on a oceanfront property, it's about a 45 second to maybe a minute to pull that trim, pop in a new module, and then put the trim back in. The difference being is the software behind that and how it's programmed. So if we have turtle seasons on the time clock, and then the time clock expires in February or what have you, we can change a module very easily in our product. I typically recommend having those secondary fixtures so that we can defer the turtle lighting fixtures that are there. And then we have standard lighting because there's going to be times when you want standard lighting on during the day, or you're going to be entertaining in different environments and you need that um, higher color temperature, broad, broader color frequency. So while it works, changing the modules, um, with us is still fairly simple, but it's not something that uh, I would encourage a homeowner doing. I'd certainly want the, the integrator to still own that and make sure they understand the differences from a programming standpoint, what turtle light does on scene five versus what a regular light would do. Okay, and in terms of designing the turtle lights, um, what does that look like? Do we need do we need more lights to get enough kind of ambient lighting outside, more turtle lights? And, and is that effect, is there a point where there's there's just too many of them out there and it becomes too bright for the turtles? Um, that would only be like if we created a proximity footprint to the ocean. You know, the reality is, is the color temperature and scale of what that is and lumen output is very specific. So uh, we build it into almost a nanometer measurement. I'm sure we could create enough of them, but the good thing is the color would be consistent. So I still don't think we can get it bright enough on the curve because of the limitations we put in the driver. Whereas if you and I put one of our regular 1,000 lumen, 3,000 Kelvins in, well, yes, we can ramp it really, really low, but the color temperature stays consistent. If we ramp it really high, it would stand out. In the case of multiple turtle lights, I still don't think we can overly impact the brightness just because the range is so limited on how we configure that driver. Okay. And I had we're gonna put we're not gonna put 30 lights under an E when it really only needs eight. Okay. You know, we, we wouldn't be gaining any <laughs> dramatic benefit doing so. That makes sense. I had a builder recently um, say that the uh, wildlife people were complaining they're they're on the ocean about the lights inside the house that were too bright. Have you heard that? Have you heard of that before? And do you have any solutions for that? 
Um, I would tell them that uh, my friend Gustavo sells nice shades. Um, <laughs> the, the reality is, is that's very true. I mean, if you have a 10 foot tall glass window and you and I might design a room around 3000 Kelvin or around warm down and we have entertainment scenes, you know, that's really how do they regulate that light and how do they control its footprint when the, the drapes are open, so to speak. Some of that's responsible living to a degree. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the uh, wildlife commissions can, um, I don't think they can dictate what we do in the house, but they may have an ability to, to present a fine if you're extending too much brightness beyond the property wall. So if it is, if they can measure it, like at the dunes, and they go, oh, look at this, I'm still getting 20 foot candles off of that light from 60 feet, and that's too intense for when a turtle wants to see five or less. That I don't know how they present that jurisdiction or how they go after it, uh, but I, I still say that shading would protect that, or you and I having a an evening scene where we know after six or six thirty, we're going to bring the lights down to a, a max level. I, I'm I I only see that legislation getting more sharp as they go forward. Yeah, I, I don't know how else to really correct for it in the house because you and I still need a safe working environment in a kitchen. You know, the the mother still has the right to fix food and for her family. So there's a balance there in my mind. Absolutely. No, that's a good point. And we, we had recommended shading. Um, my last question, Lainey, is the DMF lights and the turtle lights specifically, we do have, um, like they work well with Lutron, Lutron lighting system, dimming functionality, you know, there's no, there's no flickering. Like we have, we have good control of the dimming functions. No, so we're, we're very particular about our driver capabilities and that we're compatible with triac style dimming. Uh, we also do some proprietary stuff with Lutron on their echo platforms. Um, you know, it's not, I haven't had a need where I needed a turtle layering scene with individually addressable fixtures, because in the case of when we do that with Lutron, you, we actually modify the housing and install their driver to allow for that level of control. So you can address a device individually and it can live in more than one zone. Typically in a turtle layout, you and I are probably doing maybe two or three banks of lights in specific areas of the house, typically externally, um, or we might do a couple of the cylinders. And the reality at that is we're, we're gonna turn them on, we're gonna ramp them up, they're gonna be at their max still compliant. And then as we lower them, they're even more soft. So there's there's not a wide range uh, where I think you and I would need echo or digitally addressability. Uh, I'm sure if the property was large enough, you know, you and I might change our sentiment there. But uh, typically, I see more compatibility with those types of devices inside. Uh, dimming wise, if you look at our dimming compatibility charts. Uh, Lutron and Crestron typically have more dimmers presented than some of the other vendors. Some of that's just from the history they've been in the game. Uh, but we're, we're compatible with, with just about everybody we've run into that I can, that I can tell you we feel tested with. That's fantastic. That's great news. Um, last question is, did I miss anything that you'd like to, uh, that you'd like to answer that you think is important that we should know? I, I just think when, uh, something that we've had to get better at the last few years. Um, you know, we grew up in performance cultures. We grew up in selling things we were comfortable with, and we've sort of been the tech experts to a degree. A lot more of what we do now is looking at how the environment's going to be used. So whether that's a kitchen, a patio, or even a landscape or a pool, what have you. Uh, but I think we also need to have a, okay, how's it going to be used, but also how does it affect or effect the uh, ecosystem and environment around it. And that's something as, a, as our responsibility continues to increase in certain areas, that component needs to be thought of as much as we design to style, we design to performance, we design to aesthetic. We also need to design to impact and footprint and make sure that uh, 
we're taking those very strongly into account and conveying that message to our clients that uh, it's not always a money thing versus doing the right thing. And, and if that is a few dollars more and it justifies five years of a, a species existence and, and prospering, you got to think that way. So I've never really been much of a, a, a hunter myself. I don't look down on the hobby, but I, I think there's responsible ways to regulate things like this. Uh, and I, I want manatees and turtles here for generations to come. It's the, I've always thought they were awesome. I agree. And, you know, I think the, the more we think that way and the more we want to have a sustainable environment, the more incentive there is for the technology to improve so that it's not as, you know, maybe it's less expensive because we're doing it more because the economic incentive is there to develop it. Well, certainly as, as there's increased frequency um, and maybe more demand for the type of driver technology that we're doing, or as we find more and more volume as overall, that impacts cost. So while I don't charge more for my light module or my driver, um, they're the same price as my standards, but they're a very fixed area that they perform in. Um, we did recognize during these calls that if you're this close to the ocean and you don't do the marine finish on the exterior, it defeats the purpose. <laughs> so that's something I think you and I've learned kind of going through this. Um, but to your point, if we do more of this, or uh, I don't see DMF turning into, you know, a type of company that we aren't already. So we're not into tape lighting or uh, conventional landscape in the field. Um, and I did ask one of my vendor partners, Coastal Source, I said, what do you guys do here? And they do the very lowest wattage setting in a specific lens, but it's a one-way street. It just, you know, you, once you do that ad adaptation, it's extremely challenging to, to work backwards from there. Um, so to your point, I could see us maybe doing a little more uh, pre-templated type marine application if that volume grows at the rate that it potentially can. Uh, but the driver frequency that we're using and the color temperature that is turtle safe, that remains the consistency um, and we can apply that across every state that touches the coast. Okay. Something changes or gets more demanding and we have to bring those light levels down even further or tighten that frequency. You know, that's something that could happen. Um, I think we've done enough homework and the scientists and biologists have done enough homework that they know what we're presenting is actually safe and beneficial and non-threatening at this time. Fantastic. All right, well. Thank you so much, Lainey, for the Q for the follow up Q and A, and hopefully we uh, we have you back. We'll hit, we'll hit stop on the record button, and I'll, I'll ask Gus a question. <laughs> so, from a standpoint of technology and where we've driven this, we basically just came to the point that we had enough coastal property that absolutely needed to work in a safe way to contribute back to the environment not have sea turtles going the wrong way when they come out of the ground. And this was our motivation to try to still give an apparatus that would work on the house that our community could specify and sell. I want to thank you for this. I'm sorry if I rushed it a little bit. I tend to talk kind of quickly, uh, but I do want to open it up for any questions or if there's any slides you want me to reference, I'm happy to do that.